Test 4. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a phone conversation between Alex, an employee at a company called JPNW, and Martha, who wants to work as a trainee at the company. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hi, Alex. It's Martha Kleins here. James White gave me your number. I hope you don't mind me calling you. Of course not. How are you, Martha? Good, thanks. I'm ringing because I need a bit of advice. Oh, yeah, what about? The training you did at JPNW a few years ago. I'm applying for the same thing. Oh, right, yes. I did mine in 2014. Best thing I ever did. I'm still working there. Really? What are you doing? Well, now I work in the customer services department, but I did my initial training in finance. I stayed there for the first two years and then moved to where I am now. That's the same department I'm applying for. Did you enjoy it? Uh, I was pretty nervous to begin with. I didn't do well in my exams at school, and I was really worried because I failed maths. But it didn't actually matter because I did lots of courses on the job. Did you get a diploma at the end of your trainee period? I'm hoping to do the one in business skills. Yes, that sounds good. I took the one on IT skills, but I wish I'd done that one instead. OK, that's good to know. Um, what about the other trainees? How did you get on with them? There were about 20 of us who started at the same time, and we were all around the same age. I was 18, and there was only one person younger than me who was 17. The rest were between 18 and 20. I made some good friends. I've heard lots of good things about the training at JPNW. It seems like there are a lot of opportunities there. Yeah, definitely. Because of its size, you can work in loads of different areas within the organisation. What about pay? I know you get a lower minimum wage than regular employees. That's right, which isn't great. But you get the same number of days holiday as everyone else, and the pay goes up massively if they offer you a job at the end of the training period. Yeah, but I'm not doing it for the money. It's the experience I think will be really useful. Everyone says by the end of the year you gain so much confidence. You're right, that's the most useful part about it. There's a lot of variety too. You're given lots of different things to do. I enjoyed it all. I didn't even mind the studying. Do you have to spend any time in college? Yes, one day each month. So you get lots of support from both your tutor and your manager. Hmm, that's good. And the company is easy to get to, isn't it? Yes, it's very close to the train station, so the location's a real advantage. Before you hear the rest of the phone conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10.
Have you got a date for your interview yet? Yes, it's on the 23rd of this month. So long as you're well prepared, there's nothing to worry about. Everyone's very friendly. I am not sure what I should wear. What do you think? Nothing too casual, like jeans, for example. If you've got a nice jacket, wear that with a skirt or trousers. OK, thanks. Any other tips? Um, well, I know it's really obvious, but arrive in plenty of time. They hate people who are late. So make sure you know exactly where you have to get to. And one other useful piece of advice my manager told me before I had the interview for this job is to smile. Even if you feel terrified, it makes people respond better to you. <laughs> I'll have to practice doing that in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, well, good luck. Let me know if you need any more information. Thanks very much. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a guide talking to a group of visitors to a farm. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Welcome to the Fiddy Working Heritage Farm. This open-air museum gives you the experience of agriculture and rural life in the English countryside at the end of the 19th century. So you'll see a typical farm of that period, and like me, all the staff are dressed in clothes of that time. I must give you some advice and safety tips before we go any further. As it's a working farm, please don't frighten or injure the animals. We have a lot here, and many of them are breeds that are now quite rare. And do stay at a safe distance from the tools. Some of them have sharp points, which can be pretty dangerous, so please don't touch them. We don't want any accidents, do we? The ground is very uneven, and you might slip if you're wearing sandals, so I'm glad to see you're all wearing shoes. We always advise people to do that. Now, children of all ages are very welcome here, and usually even very young children love the ducks and lambs, so do bring them along next time you come. I don't think any of you have brought dogs with you, but in case you have... I'm afraid they'll have to stay in the car park unless they're guide dogs. I'm sure you'll understand that they could cause a lot of problems on a farm. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now let me give you some idea of the layout of the farm. The building where you bought your tickets is the new barn immediately to your right. 
and we're now at the beginning of the main path to the farmland. And of course, the car park is on your left. The scarecrow you can see in the car park in the corner beside the main path is a traditional figure for keeping the birds away from crops. But our scarecrow is a permanent sculpture. It's taller than a human being, so you can see it from quite a distance. If you look ahead of you, you'll see a maze. It's opposite the new barn, beside the side path that branches off to the right, just over there. The maze is made out of hedges which are too tall for young children to see over them, but it's quite small, so you can't get lost in it. Now, can you see the bridge crossing the fish pool further up the main path? If you want to go to the cafe, go towards the bridge and turn right just before it. Walk along the side path and the cafes on the first bend you come to. The building was originally the schoolhouse, and it's well over a hundred years old. As you may know, we run skills workshops here, where you can learn traditional crafts like woodwork and basket making. You can see examples of the work and talk to someone about the courses in the Black Barn. If you take the side path to the right here, just by the new barn. You'll come to the black barn just where the path first bends. Now I mustn't forget to tell you about picnicking, as I can see some of you have brought your lunch with you. You can picnic in the field, though do clear up behind you, of course. Or if you'd prefer a covered picnic area, there's one near the farmyard just after you cross the bridge. There's a covered picnic spot on the right. And the last thing to mention is Fiddy House itself. From here, you can cross the bridge, then walk along the footpath through the field to the left of the farmyard. That goes to the house, and it'll give you a lovely view of it. It's certainly worth a few photographs, but as it's a private home, I'm afraid you can't go inside. Right. Well, if you're all ready, we'll set off on our tour of the farm. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear two students called Jack and Alice discussing food labels that give information on the nutritional value of foods. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. I still got loads to do for our report on nutritional food labels. Me too. What did you learn from doing the project about your own shopping habits? Well, I've always had to check labels for traces of peanuts in everything I eat because of my allergy. But beyond that, I've never really been concerned enough to check how healthy a product is. This project has actually taught me to read the labels much more carefully. I tended to believe claims on packaging like low in fat, but I now realise that the healthy yogurt I've bought for years is full of sugar, and that it's actually quite high in calories.、Mm. Ready meals are the worst. 
Comparing the labels on supermarket pizzas was a real eye-opener. Did you have any idea how many calories they contain? I was amazed. Yes, because unless you read the label really carefully, you wouldn't know that the nutritional values given are for half a pizza. When most people eat the whole pizza. Not exactly transparent, is it? Not at all. But I expect it won't stop you from buying pizza. Probably not, no. I thought comparing the different labelling systems used by food manufacturers was interesting. I think the kind of labelling system used makes a big difference. Which one did you prefer? I liked the traditional daily value system best, the one which tells you what proportion of your required daily intake of each ingredient the product contains. I'm not sure it's the easiest for people to use, but at least you get the full story. I like to know all the ingredients in a product, not just how much fat, salt and sugar they contain. But it's good supermarkets have been making an effort to provide reliable information for customers. Yes. There just needs to be more consistency between labelling systems used by different supermarkets in terms of portion sizes, etc. Hmm. The labels on the different brands of chicken flavour crisps were quite revealing too, weren't they? Yeah. I don't understand how they can get away with calling them chicken flavour when they only contain artificial additives. I know. I'd at least have expected them to contain a small percentage of real chicken. Absolutely. I think having nutritional food labelling has been a good idea, don't you? I think it will change people's behaviour and stop mothers, in particular, buying the wrong things. But didn't that study kind of prove the opposite? People didn't necessarily stop buying unhealthy products. They only said that might be the case. Those findings weren't that conclusive, and it was quite a small-scale study. I think more research has to be done. Yes, I think you're probably right. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. What do you think of the traffic light system? I think supermarkets like the idea of having a colour-coded system, red, orange or green, for levels of fat, sugar and salt in a product. But it's not been adopted universally, and not on all products. Why do you suppose that is? Pressure from the food manufacturers. Hardly surprising that some of them are opposed to flagging up how unhealthy their products are. I'd have thought it would have been compulsory. It seems ridiculous it isn't. I know. And what I couldn't get over is the fact that it was brought in without enough consultation. A lot of experts had deep reservations about it. That is a bit weird. I suppose there's an argument for doing the research now when consumers are familiar with this system. Yeah, maybe. The participants in the survey were quite positive about the traffic light system. Hmm. But I don't think they targeted the right people. They should have focused on people with low literacy levels because these labels are designed to be accessible to them. Yeah. But it's good to get feedback from all socio-economic groups and there wasn't much variation in their responses. No. But if they hadn't interviewed participants face-to-face, -face, they could have used a much bigger sample size. I wonder why they chose that method. Dunno. How were they selected? Did they volunteer or were they approached? I think they volunteered. The thing that wasn't stated was how often they bought packaged food. All we know is how frequently they used the supermarket. That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4. Section 4 You will hear part of a student presentation about the variety of different species that live in the world's oceans. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I've been looking at ocean biodiversity, that's the diversity of species that live in the world's oceans. About 20 years ago, biologists developed the idea of what they called biodiversity hotspots. These are the areas which have the greatest mixture of species, so, one example is Madagascar. These hotspots are significant because they allow us to locate key areas for focusing efforts at conservation. Biologists can identify hotspots on land fairly easily, but until recently, very little was known about species distribution and diversity in the oceans, and no one even knew if hotspots existed there. Then a Canadian biologist called Boris Worm did some research in 2005 on data on ocean species that he got from the fishing industry. Worm located five hotspots for large ocean predators, like sharks, and looked at what they had in common. The main thing he'd expected to find was that they had very high concentrations of food, but to his surprise, that was only true for four of the hotspots. The remaining hotspot was quite badly off in that regard. But what he did find was that in all cases, the water at the surface of the ocean had relatively high temperatures, even when it was cool at greater depths. So this seemed to be a factor in supporting a diverse range of these large predators. However, this wasn't enough on its own, because he also found that the water needed to have enough oxygen in it. So these two factors seemed necessary to support the high metabolic rate of these large fish. A couple of years later, in 2007, a researcher called Lisa Balance, who was working in California, also started looking for ocean hotspots, but not for fish. What she was interested in was marine mammals, things like seals. And she found three places in the oceans which were hotspots, and what these had in common was that these hotspots were all located at boundaries between ocean currents. And this seems to be the sort of place that has lots of the plankton that some of these species feed on. So now people who want to protect the species that are endangered need to get as much information as possible. For example, there's an international project called the Census of Marine Life. They've been surveying oceans all over the world, including the Arctic. One thing they found there, which stunned other researchers, was that there were large numbers of species which live below the ice, sometimes under a layer up to 20 metres thick. Some of these species had never been seen before. They've even found species of octopus living in these conditions. And other scientists working on the same project, but researching very different habitats on the ocean floor, have found large numbers of species congregating around volcanoes, attracted to them by the warmth and nutrients there. However, biologists still don't know how serious the threat to their survival is for each individual species. 
So, a body called the Global Marine Species Assessment is now creating a list of endangered species on land, so they consider things like the size of the population, how many members of one species there are in a particular place, and then they look at their distribution in geographical terms. Although this is quite difficult when you're looking at fish because they're so mobile. And then, thirdly, they calculate the rate at which the decline of the species is happening. So far, only 1,500 species have been assessed, but they want to increase this figure to 20,000. For each one they assess, they use the data they collect on that species to produce a map showing its distribution. Ultimately, they will be able to use these to figure out not only where most species are located, but also where they are most threatened. So, finally, what can be done to retain the diversity of species in the world's oceans? Firstly, we need to set up more reserves in our oceans, places where marine species are protected. We have some, but not enough. In addition. To preserve species such as leatherback turtles, which live out in the high seas but have their nesting sites on the American coast, we need to create corridors for migration, so they can get from one area to another safely. As well as this, action needs to be taken to lower the levels of fishing quotas to prevent overfishing of endangered species. And finally, there's the problem of bycatch. This refers to the catching of unwanted fish by fishing boats. They're returned to the sea, but they're often dead or dying. If these commercial fishing boats used equipment which was more selective, so that only the fish wanted for consumption were caught, this problem could be overcome. Okay. So, does anyone have any questions? That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.